All right, well, good morning again, everybody. How we doing? Very good. Is anybody still soaked from the rain just a little bit? A little bit. We'll be soaked together. It's all good. It's all good. Hey, well, uh, we are beginning a new sermon series this morning that, as you just saw, we're entitling Chapter 2. Now, I've got to be honest with you guys. Would it hurt any of your feelings and step on any of your toes if I told you the truth that I have never used a typewriter in my entire life? Oh, oh. I got thumbs down and booze last night. Can you believe that? Terrible way to start a sermon, man. Uh, if you handed me a sheet of paper, Trevor, can you put that in the typewriter? Nope. Yeah, I would be guessing. Apparently, some have on switches, some have off switches, some are electric, some are not. I don't know. I've never, ever used one before. But it's a great artistic illustration, isn't it? <laughs> Well, anyway, we are beginning a new sermon series this morning, and we're calling it Chapter 2. We're really excited about it. Here's the basic premise of this. We believe that Jesus makes a difference in human lives, and that when Jesus enters the scene, it moves somebody from Chapter 1 to Chapter 2. And the premise of this series is we're going to be looking at the events that happened to the very first followers of Jesus immediately after the Easter event, immediately after the resurrection. So we're going to jump into that, jump into that in just a minute. Speaking of Easter, uh, man, we had an incredible weekend last week, and didn't we? How many of you were here for Easter? Yeah, it was fantastic. It was such a great service. Can I tell you guys how many people came to Community of Hope across the weekend? Can I tell you? All right. We had, across all our services last weekend, 2,724 people show up. Isn't that amazing? Incredible. You guys packed it out across all six services that we had. Here's the real telling numbers. Uh, with our Kids of Hope ministry, our children's ministry, they had nearly 100 more kids than last year alone. Think about that. That's nuts. That's worth clapping about. That's great. Another thing that's really cool is we had nearly 200, just under that, nearly, uh, just under 200 more people who are streaming online uh, than last year alone. So that platform is just skyrocketing now. If you haven't checked that out, we've done some great upgrades. Everyone turn around and look at the room back there. See how we built that out? And everybody look at the camera back there, wave, say, say hi to everybody. That's the live camera right now to everyone who's streaming with us online. If you haven't checked it out, check it out. It's a great platform. We've invested some, uh, some great resources in that to make that a better experience because more and more and more people are doing that. And it's a totally legitimate way to come to worship. So we're really excited about that. Uh, so I want to say as one of the pastors of our church, a huge thank you to all of our volunteers. You guys are rock stars to help us pull off such an incredible event. I want to say thank you to our staff. We have the best staff in the whole wide world. Can we honor them? So it was a great weekend where we sent out the message of hope, the message of Jesus. So we're excited about that. And so last week, Pastor Dale, he taught from the Gospel of Luke, and he had an incredible message for us. We got a lot of awesome feedback about that, that people really loved what we had, what he had to say, and that was really great. Uh, Dale is not here this morning. He's not off this weekend. Last night, he did a wedding. Aww. Isn't that nice? We love love here at Community of Hope. And uh, so he has a special morning this morning. I'm going to ask for prayer for Pastor Dale. Pastor Dale is going to, many of you know about how we are going to be uh, opening up our first multi-site campus later on this year. Good Shepherd United Methodist Church is uh, going to be joining us and becoming a second campus of Community of Hope. And so what Pastor Dale is doing this morning, he's going to be at Good Shepherd later this morning having an open Q&A where anybody can ask him any question that they want. So pray for Dale, okay? Um, so deal, yes? Yeah. Yes, very good. Now one thing that experts say um, whenever we're doing this type of work where you're opening up a, another campus and a church is joining uh, a lead church, like how we're doing in this situation, we try to over-communicate what's going on. So we've created a website for everybody at Good Shepherd and for everybody here uh, to get all sorts of information. You can see it on the screen. It's communityofhope.church slash Good Shepherd. Community of Hope Church slash Good Shepherd. What you'll find on there is a great letter from Pastor Dale talking about why we're doing this, why we think God's in it, how it all started, and then a list of frequently asked questions that we've called both from here out in Loxahatchee and from Good Shepherd of just various questions that we keep finding people say over and over again, and a link to on the website so if you don't see your question answered, you can email your question and we'll get to you as soon as we can. We want to keep everybody informed as best as we can, so make sure you check that out. So, 
Last week, Pastor Dale, in his great message, started from the Gospel of Luke. Now, how many of you remember what he said who wrote Luke? It's easy. Ah, you guys are smart. Somebody took notes. Good. All right, so Luke is written by a guy named Luke. He was a doctor. So for our purposes, we're going to call him Dr. Luke. Everyone say that, Dr. Luke. Dr. Luke. Very good. Dr. Luke wrote Luke. Now, here's what's interesting. Luke, Dr. Luke, not only wrote his gospel, but he also wrote a second volume work called the Book of Acts. Pastor Dale briefly touched, that on, touched on that last week as well. So he wrote about the life of Jesus and then what happened immediately after Jesus was resurrected and he ascended into heaven, what happened to this ragtag group of followers he had and how they would go on to change the world. So I think it's appropriate in a sermon series we're calling chapter two that we're understanding that Dr. Luke wrote his chapter one, which is the Gospel of Luke, but Dr. Luke has his own chapter two, which is the book of Acts. So what we're gonna be doing in this sermon series is looking at different stories from the book of Acts about how Jesus makes a difference in the lives of people. So let's talk about the book of Acts for just a second. Dr. Luke's chapter two. Uh, the book of Acts follows lots of different characters. It doesn't follow just one person. So here's the main character in the book of Acts. It's the message of Jesus. It's the gospel. That's why the characters change, but it's always following how the message is going out into the world and changing lives. Another thing that you'll need to know about the book of Acts that's very important is it's built upon an entire framework of important speeches that will go on to change the world. So lots and lots of important speeches and sermons that are recorded in the book of Acts. So we're in a sermon series called Chapter 2. We're reading Dr. Luke's Chapter 2, the book of Acts, and we're going to look at Chapter 2, of the book of Acts itself. So we are all over this idea of chapter two. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Acts chapter two. It's on your sermon notes now. And here's what you need to know about Acts chapter two. It is the mother of all chapter twos. It is phenomenal. It's important. It's uh, what happened is in what's recorded in Acts chapter two changed the world. In Acts chapter two, many of you know it's famous because it's the chapter on the day of Pentecost when God poured out the Holy Spirit upon the followers of Jesus. Here's what you need to know about that. In the Old Testament, uh, the Holy Spirit only came upon certain people for certain purposes and for certain times. It wasn't available to everybody. And in this chapter of the Bible, that changed forever. Jesus ascended into heaven, and through him, God sent the Holy Spirit to anybody who would call on the name of Jesus. So anybody can have the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, it's not just for special kings and prophets and, and famous people in the Old Testament. It's for all of us. And so what happens, they're praying together. It's 72 of them. They're praying in this room in Jerusalem, and woof. God sends the Holy Spirit, the room shakes, and weird, supernatural things start happening because the atmosphere is spiritually charged. One of the things that happened in particular is everybody in the room started to spontaneously speak a language that they naturally did not know on their own. So it would be like if all of us here in this room supernaturally started speaking different languages, like English, okay, but then if some of us started speaking supernaturally Spanish or Portuguese or Creole or, wait, no, that's just South Florida. Hold on, let me find a better example. What if, what if the Holy Spirit fell in this room and somebody started speaking Chinese? That one's a little bit harder. And somebody started speaking, I don't know, French or German. And some started speaking uh, Japanese. And some started speaking Loxahatchees. And, you know, just all the different types of languages. that We speak American here, Pastor Trevor. I don't know what you're talking about. So... Uh, so everyone starts to speak all these languages supernaturally. Now, here's what I love about the Bible. If that sounds like crazy to you, it is in, a, in one sense because you're thinking this like, gosh, Luke must, Dr. Luke must have been taking some crazy pills to write something like this. But here's how you know that the Bible is true. If you were making up this story and all these people started to supernaturally speak all these different languages, the whole crowd that heard them would have been totally on board. If you were making it up, you'd want it to sound successful, wouldn't you? Right? If you're fabricating it. That's not what Dr. Luke records. In fact, he says that the first response of the crowd as they heard all these languages going out, speaking supernaturally, the first thing that Luke says the crowd said was, those people are drunk. They're off their rocker. It's 9 a.m. They've been hitting the Thunderbird a little too early. 
That's what happens. Now, so for me, I read that and go, of course, that makes perfect sense. That's exactly what happened in, today, day, in today's day and age. If something as weird as that would have happened, people would have thought they're crazy, they're drunk, something else is going on. So the, the apostle Peter, he decides to get up and stand in front of everybody and delivers the first Christian message ever. And here's how he opens it up. He says, everybody, we're not drunk. Great opening line. <laughs> we're not drunk. In fact, what you're seeing here isn't that. This is the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. And he goes on to explain how because of the life of Jesus, that God now is pouring out his Holy Spirit upon anybody who calls upon his name. And he describes what Jesus has done, how he lived a godly life. He healed the sick. He was crucified on a Roman cross and died. But three days later, God the Father resurrected him from the dead. Not resuscitated, resurrected him from the dead the dead. And because of that, now this gift is available to everybody and explains the spiritually charged atmosphere that they're all having. And in a final culminating moment in Acts 2, 36, Peter decides to summarize everything he says. And he starts here, verse 36. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children, for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. And with many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. And those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. Wow. Wow, we thought it was a big deal that we had 2,700 people in church, not adding 3,000 people in one day. That's a big, big deal. So this is the birthday of this Jesus movement. It's the birthday of the church. The church is not a building. The church is not a denomination. The church is the movement of people who love Jesus, who are carrying his name out into the world. Somebody say amen to that. Amen. amen. It's the birthday of the church. It's a powerful, powerful story. Now, here's what I want you to notice. Most of the time when people preach out of Acts chapter 2, they focus on the Holy Spirit. We did that last year in a sermon series. Here's what I want you to focus on this morning. It's this phrase, verse 37. They were cut to the heart. They were cut to the heart. Now, you have to ask yourself the interpretive question of what was it that cut these people to the heart? What was it that gripped them? What was it exactly that caused such a strong reaction in these 3,000 people? What I think it's pretty clear if you take a deeper look at the text. It's just the verse above. It's the statement that Peter makes where he said, God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, here it is, both Lord and Messiah. Let's talk about what these two things mean. Let's talk first about this phrase. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. This is, uh, this statement was and is the fundamental belief and confession of Christianity in all places at all times. It's the first thing that people had to believe early on in order to call yourselves a follower of Christ. Now when Peter says God has made this Jesus Lord, what he's implying there is not saying that God has made him good master, that God has made him teacher. No, Peter is making a huge declaration with this phrase. What he's saying is that by his resurrection, God the Father has vindicated Jesus as divine. This is the same word that's used 6,000 times in the Old Testament to describe no one else other than the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. What Peter is saying with this is that God the Father has made Jesus God the Son. Ooh, let me rephrase that. God had declared that Jesus, he had vindicated him forever and said that he was God the Son, that Jesus is divine. It's most basically this. Jesus is Lord means Jesus is God. Now, that's a big deal, and that's a big phrase. When I think about that, when I think about this whole idea of Jesus is Lord, I think about this book. This is in my top five favorite books. It's one of my all-time favorite ones. Isn't it a beautiful book? It's teal. They made the pages teal. Isn't it nice? It's good. All the ladies like it's pretty, and guys like, I don't care. Color. Woof. <laughs> 
Uh, this book here is an autobiography of a great man. I read this book when I was in school, and uh, I keep rereading it because it's that important to me. See, uh, you need heroes in your life, and you not only need living heroes of people to be role models, you also need dead heroes too because some of your heroes who are living might not make it to the finish line still being a hero, right? Now, but here... With this book, with this, with the man who wrote this book is a man named E. Stanley Jones. Now, if you've been coming here to church for a little bit, you've heard us talk about him before. E. Stanley Jones died 10 years before I was born. I'm only going to meet this guy in heaven. And he's a hero of mine who's now living with Jesus. Now, here's what you need to know about E. Stanley Jones. He was a great man. He was an evangelist. He was known as the Billy Graham of India. In fact, one year, E. Stanley Jones was such a big deal, he was the runner-up for the Nobel Peace Prize Award and lost to no one else than a guy named Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Good person to lose to, right? So he was a big deal. He was a big deal. Now, E. Stanley Jones, he wrote about this in his autobiography and pictures of him doing this. He always had this, this salute. He called it the three-finger salute, not the one-finger salute. I've seen some of you drive. The three-finger salute. <laughs> The three finger salute, and he has it in various pictures. He always, always held up the three fingers, go ahead and do the next one too, in every single picture. In fact, look at his signature there. What his three finger salute stood for is Jesus is Lord. And he wanted this to be the universal symbol of Christianity worldwide because he understood that this phrase that Peter said on the day of Pentecost is absolutely pivotal. E. Stanley Jones, when he was working with people and having conversations about faith and spirituality all across the world, he always wanted to drive the discussion to the phrase, Jesus is Lord. Why? Because if you have other questions about the Bible, yeah, sometimes those are barriers to our faith. But really, the ultimate question is, is Jesus Lord or not? Because all of the questions that people have about faith are peripheral, but the one of, is Jesus is Lord or not, is personal. How so? Because if Jesus is Lord, if Jesus is God, then that means everything Jesus ever said is true. And if Jesus is God, that means everything he ever said about God is true. And about life is true. And about eternity is true. And about good and evil. And yes, even about you. It's true. And so the statement, if Jesus is Lord, it makes a personal implication on your life depending on how you answer it. And that's why he always said it was foundational. Jesus is Lord. Why were they cut to the heart in the day of Pentecost? Because that phrase makes a claim on you. And if you don't listen to the great evangelist E. Stanley Jones, perhaps you listen to the prolific rapper Lecrae, where Lecrae says this, if he's truly been raised to life, then this is news that should change your life. If Jesus is Lord. So the claim Jesus is Lord is personal, but then, Jesus, but then Peter makes it even more personal from there. He really takes it to the crowd. He goes on to say in verse 36, this Jesus whom you crucified, geez, Peter, way to be heavy handed there, way to make friends and influence people, good grief. He says, whom you crucified. Now what he's saying there to the crowd, what he's saying is literally true. He's not being metaphorical. This is the crowd that turned over Jesus to Pontius Pilate. This is the crowd that chanted, crucify him, crucify him. And what they did, they literally were the ones who handed him over. They were the ones who literally had his blood on their hands, his, their guilt on their hands for crucifying Jesus. Now what's tied to that is the word at the end of the phrase, whom you crucified, God has made him Messiah. If you're taking notes, underline Messiah as well. Here's what this means. Basically means that Jesus is king. The Messiah was meant to be the king of the Jews, the king of Israel. In fact, the sign that hung on the cross above Jesus' head said the king of the Jews. Jesus is Messiah, and you crucified him. Now, this doesn't apply to any of us here. None of us were there 2,000 years ago. None of us had time machines. None of us went back there and said, yeah, crucify him, crucify him. But here's the point that Peter is making. It's not just the fact that they were guilty of him being condemned to death and being crucified. What Peter is implying here is that, yes, God has made this Jesus your king, and you have rejected him. And that's what's true for all of us. Peter's getting at the idea of sin. Is sin breaking rules? Sure. 
The deeper issue with sin is relationship. And the deeper issue with sin is that people have rejected Jesus as their king and their Lord. And so what cut them to the heart? It's these two things. Jesus is Lord, and I've rejected him. It cut them to the heart. Now this is what it's like for every person who first becomes a follower of Jesus. Many of you, if you've been following Jesus for any period of time, you understand this. You remembered what it was like before you started to follow. Maybe some of you are navigating that process now and you're starting to come to this realization. See, before God cuts your heart with understanding that Jesus is God and oh my goodness, I've been pushing him away all my life. Before you come to that realization, you kind of have a false sense of peace about life that everything's okay. And that life is generally all right. And yeah, sure, you might recognize that there's sin in your life, but you're not bothered by it. It doesn't dig at you. And oftentimes, before people get cut to the heart, they put off this whole God and Jesus stuff, say, I'll deal with that tomorrow. I'll deal with that next year. I'll deal with that next week. But then when this moment comes, when you realize that Jesus, oh my goodness, is actually God, and I've been pushing him away, what begins to happen is the false sense of peace that you might have had in life begins to go away. And the sin that you do have in your life yeah, you recognize it, and it begins to bother you too. And you realize that tomorrow isn't guaranteed for anybody. It's not promised. And so this crowd was cut to the heart. And this is what good Christian preaching does. It's a great model for people like me, what Peter does here. Because Good Christian preaching just doesn't want people to agree with an idea. It wants to drive people to a point of decision. It wants people to make a choice. It wants people to move to action. And that's what happens here. People get cut to the heart and they respond to Peter and they say to him, in verse 37, they said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? And so Peter thinks about it. This is the first time he's ever preached. It's the first Christian message ever. He said, what do you do? Oh, gosh, what did Jesus used to tell people to do? What did he used to tell people to do? I remember. Peter says this in verse 38. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, the promises for you and for your children, for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. See, great preaching not only leads people to a point of decision, but it holds out the promise of God. And the promise of God is this, that when we confess our sins, God washes us clean, that God forgives us, and God gives people a fresh start to start over again. And not only that, but God also promises his Holy Spirit to come live inside of your heart to not only forgive you of sin, but to free you of the sin you needed to be forgiven for in the first place. Amen? Amen. Amen. So he holds out the decision, but he holds out the promise to, and he says, all you got to do is repent, which just basically means make a U-turn, go the other way. If that's what all it means, then it means this, that I am going to choose to believe that Jesus is Lord, that he is God, that he did die on the cross, that he was resurrected on the third day. And not only am I going to say yes to that he's Lord, but I'm going to say yes to him being my Messiah. I'm going to receive him, not reject him as my king and my Lord, my leader and my forgiver. And when people do that, then you can realize and lean into what Romans 10, 9 says, what says this here. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Amen. Amen. And friends, this is what baptism is all about. Go and throw up that picture, Tom. That's what this means. We did infant baptism this morning, but we're going to do adult baptism next week. We do it by immersion. So we lower people to the water. It's symbolizing of dying with Christ. And what goes down into the water and gets nailed to the cross is our past and our sin and our guilt and our shame and our chapter one. 
And when we pull people out of the water, it's the outward and visible sign of being resurrected with Christ. And what comes out is being forgiven and being freed and being filled with the Holy Spirit and having new life. And what comes up out of the water is chapter two. And you come up out of the water with a future, with hope. Baptism is how God turns the page from chapter one to chapter two. So as I said, good Christian preaching leads people to a point of decision, not just to agree. So what's the decision God's calling each of us to make this morning? You're in one of three camps. Here's the first one. You're already a follower of Jesus, and you already have been baptized. What do you do? Here's what you do. Go home. Do you need to get baptized again? No, because the first cleansing that Jesus did for you is good, past, present, and future, right? That's why we only believe in one baptism. But here's what you can do. Go home. Put your hand in some water. Make a sign of the cross on your forehead. And there's an ancient saying that Christians have been saying to each other for centuries, and it's this. Remember your baptism and be thankful. So make the sign of the cross on your forehead and say, God, thank you that you gave me a chapter two, a future with hope. Here's the second group. You're already a follower of Jesus and you have not yet been baptized. What do you think I'm gonna tell you? <laughs> First off, your Lord and your Savior commands it of you. He says, be baptized, <coughs> so you should do it. It's easy enough. But more than that, you're cheating yourself if you don't go do this. There's a famous legendary story of the great reformer Martin Luther where one morning... Uh, or late at night, I should say, Martin Luther was writing in his study, and all of a sudden, on the wall, across from him in his study, handwriting started to appear and started to write out all of his sins. And Martin Luther describes it as it was the hand of the devil literally appearing on the wall of his study, telling him of all of his sins and reminding him of every evil thing he'd ever done. It's like out of a horror movie, isn't it? You know what he did? He took the inkwell off his desk, chucked it at the wall so ink splattered everywhere, and he said to the devil, hey, you forgot some, but make sure when you're done, right over it all, Martin Luther is baptized. Now I hope the devil's not writing on your bedroom walls at night, <laughs> but I know for sure he's writing on the walls of your mind, the things you've done in the past. If you haven't been baptized yet, you're cheating yourself out of having a great a uh, tool of assurance to knowing I am washed. I am in chapter two. My chapter one went down into the water and died with Christ. And you need to be able to say that to the enemy. If you haven't been baptized, you're cheating yourself. And by the way, baptism is next weekend. <laughs> and you could sign up online. And the deadline's today. Go to communityofhope.church slash baptism. I'm serious. Do it. And there's a table out in the back where people will sign you up if you don't want to go online either. They'll be waiting for you right after the service. And here's the last one. You're not yet a follower of Jesus, and so you haven't been baptized. And this one's easy. What's your application? The invitation for you is to today. Today. You might not have tomorrow. Today. Say yes to Jesus being your Lord. Say yes to him being your king. Say yes to the chapter two he's holding out for you. Let's pray. So Lord, we thank you that you are the God of the chapter two. You are the God of the fresh start of the new beginning of giving a future with hope. We give you great thanks for that. And God, for all the different applications that we have, for what we've heard from your word this morning, we pray now that you would speak to each individual heart and life now. And Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would move all of us to action in this time. It's in your name we pray. Amen. We're going to have friends here on the side of the room who will be willing to pray with you about anything you like. Let's seek God now.